Amen, amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen. Welcome to another session of Bible study. We have been discussing doctrine, and we have been looking at the apostles' doctrine, and now we are looking at the different doctrines that the Bible may mention that we should not partake of. Amen. So before we proceed, I just want to welcome everybody and read a word of prayer. Just bow your heads as I pray. Lord, we appreciate you. We love you. We adore you. We magnify you. We thank you, great God, for all that you have done for us and for all that you will be doing. As we prepare our hearts to get in your words, we pray, Father, that you will be in our midst. Lord, we might not be together physically, but we are are joined, God, in the spirit, and we are joined on a platform. We pray, God, that you will be with us, and we ask, God, that you intervene in our midst. We pray, God, that whatever is said will be to your glory, and that your people be edified, and that you be glorified. Let your will be done, as we give you thanks tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So you know our team scriptures, taken from first... Timothy chapter 4, and the second one is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, for tonight, we are just going to read 2 Timothy chapter 4 from verse 1 through to verse 4, right? I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust have, shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So last week, you know, we always do a little recap. And last week, we looked at the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And like the scripture that we read in 2 Timothy says, that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I believe that that time is now. Yes, and it's not just now, it has, it has been here for a while. But we must recognize as people of God that we are living in the last and closing days of time. And because we are in the last and closing days, we are going to find an increase in false teaching. We are going to find an increase in doctrines that go against the principles of God. And as individuals who love God, as individuals who want to see him, face to face as Lord and Savior, then we are going to have to stand up for what God has brought us into. And we have got to defend also what God has brought us into. And we have got to have that made up mind that irrespective of, we are not going to turn from this unto that, which is not another gospel. Amen. So we look at the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we said last week that as we continue what, what we are going to do as we look at these doctrines is that we are going to look at some of the practices, look at some of the beliefs, and we are going to, as we point out, we also point out to us why it is that we should not embrace these doctrines and these teachings because of what the scripture says against them. So Jesus spoke about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And then in Mark 8, verse 15, he charged them again, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Also in Luke 2, verse 1, in the 
Meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, in so much that they trod upon another, he began to say unto his disciple, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. As in many of Jesus' teaching, Jesus used everyday items or everyday things to bring out points in the spiritual. In the case of leaven or yeast, to demonstrate the spiritual truth. In Luke 12, verse 1, that we read, Jesus referred to the east of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus teaching was that the leaving of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. It was pervasive in that it will spread throughout an individual's being. And then when it is finished, it will produce hypocrisy and unbelief. Can you imagine coming to know Christ and then after knowing Christ for years you give heed to some form of doctrine and it, and it work and work upon you until you become unbelieving. And remember as we went through the apostles doctrine we said that faith is a critical part because the Bible did say without faith it is impossible to Please the Lord. The fact that Jesus used the word leaven to warn his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He, he was both saying to them that this thing you must be careful of. When we look in both the Old and New Testament, we recognize that leaven is used as a symbol of of sin. So when leaven is placed into the dough, for those who understand about baking, when it is placed into the dough, what it does is that it reacts with the dough sugar, producing a gas that will expand the loaves. So when leaven enters a person's life, like we have been saying, uh, licking leaven, leaven the whole lump, when it enters a person's life, what it does is that it slowly eats away at the individual, slowly eats away of the godly appeal of the individual, and then have that individual know to turn from God and turn unto the things of Satan. So Jesus used that to say, look here, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which is hypocrisy. And leaven is a representation of sin, both in the Old and the New Testament. Amen. Just jumping down a little bit. We look at the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We look at some of their beliefs. One of the things that we pointed out was that the Pharisees, they believe in a resurrection. They believe that an individual at a certain point will raise again and they will face a judgment because of the work that is done in their body. Now, the Sadducees, on the other hand, they did not believe in, a resur in the resurrection. And we read the scripture last week where they came to Jesus and asked him if a man had, has a wife and he died and his brother went in unto that, married that lady, and he died. And when the resurrection come, whose wife will she be? They ask a the question trying to tempt Jesus. Now Jesus let them know that, look here, you don't understand what God has said because when we get to that place, we will be like the angels and we will have no need for married. So, The, that scripture is found in St. Matthew chapter 22, verse, verses 23 to 34. So the fact that they did not believe in the resurrection, it was a good enough reason to even deny the resurrection of Christ and discredit 
the resurrection of Christ, after they successfully sent Jesus to the cross, the members of the Sanhedrin feared that his disciples would sneak in and steal his body. They asked and they received guards to guard the tomb. Although they didn't believe such things could happen, they took Jesus' claim that he would rise again in three days in a literal sense. You see the irony of it? They do, generally don't believe in a resurrection, but because of the work that they saw and heard that Jesus did, when he told them that he was going to raise back this temple in three days, they now begin to think that, look here, this man might do what he says. And so until this day, among the Jews, it is still said that the Messiah has not yet arrived. I want you to understand that there is the spirit that goes with this doctrine, the doctrine of the Sadducees, which says that there will be no resurrection, is a dreadful spirit. I want you to know, as we mentioned, that there are modern day Pharisees and Sadducees, there are modern day Sadducees that teaches that hell is a place. Not a place of eternal suffering, but rather a common grave. They say after the, the, the body is, is, is passed off, then that is it. You know, they are modern day Sadducees that teaches that the soul is but the life within a man. And when the, the man dies, that is the end of the soul. There are Pharisees, Sadducees that teaches that Jesus' resurrection was only spiritual, it was not physical. When we read the scripture that Jesus said, come put your finger in my hand that is pierced. Put your hand in my side that was pierced. And folks are still teaching today that the Jesus only rose spiritually. There are Sadducees today who are telling folks that there is no such thing as a resurrection. And when we look at the the researches that were done last week, we recognize that even people who are Christians were not sure what to think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, much less a resurrection of the dead. And I want us to understand that this is the doctrine of the Sadducees, and this doctrine is alive today, and people are losing out because they are persuaded that there will not be a resurrection. If we embrace, if we believe that there is no resurrection, then there is no urgency to get our souls right so that when the resurrection comes, we might be, be with Jesus and hear, well done, though good and faithful servant. The Bible in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through to 18 he said, no, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he rose up Christ. When he raised, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So what the apostle is saying is that if we believe that Christ is not risen. Then we are still in our sins. I said last week that I am confident, I am sure that the resurrection is real. And one of my reasons for that is because of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is real, then we can safely conclude that the resurrection is real. If if, if the Spirit of God, this supernatural Spirit of God that comes to be in mortal men, and I am a testament that the Holy Ghost is real, then I am 
sure that the resurrection is real. If there is any folk that is listening tonight and they are telling you that the resurrection is not real, then they are telling you a lie. And I'm telling you that that is a lie from the pit of hell. And we have got to be careful of the things that we choose to listen and that we choose to believe because the resurrection is real. Jesus' own word, he said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And the comforter is here. And we discuss that the comforter is here when we mention um, in the doctrine of the apostles, when they talk about the infilling of the Holy Ghost, when we talk about the comforter, we are talking about the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is here. Amen, somebody. Just running down. So Jesus said, so again, the, the Sadducees, they did not believe in the resurrection. And Jesus said, if I go, then I will send the comforter. The comforter is here. We then move on and we began to look at the doctrine now. So we just point out the, one of the major beliefs of the Sadducees. And we are saying that that belief is still here and it's still present. And men are still teaching today that there will not be a resurrection. And many are deceived. Then we now look at the doctrine of the Pharisees. And we said when we look at the doctrine of the Pharisees, there are many things that we can learn and many things that we need to understand so that we can stand more firmly into what it is that we believe. When we hear certain things and we see certain things, then we will shun them because we know that they are not of the Lord. So Jesus, the Pharisees, they asked Jesus for a sign. And if Jesus had, had given them a sign, they, they would probably have said that this is the true Messiah. But Jesus did not give them a sign. He said, in fact, it is a wicked and adulterous generation seek it after a sign. In this time we are living in, people are seeking after a sign and they are being given sign. We said last week that these false prophets, they have power from the Satan himself to work all kind of miracles. And people are being drawn away because, you know, they can see certain things. And if they are not seeing certain things, then look here, you're not preaching Jesus. Then you don't have any power. But once they are able to see, they say, look here, the power is over this place. And they have gone over there not knowing that these men are working with some demons, some some, some fallen angels that is able to show them some sign to win them over. And then 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8 to 9. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. It is not only those who preach the truth can work miracles. The Bible says that he will come with lying wonders and signs. And I want us to understand that is happening now because... We are so close to the coming of the Antichrist. And because we are so close, his spirit precedes him. The spirit of homosexuality precedes him. And the spirit that worketh lying wonders and sign is here. And if we are not careful, we will be drawn away by signs and lying wonders. And when we seek for a sign, somebody... God will cause you to get a sign. 
So let us not focus on getting a sign, but let us focus on a relationship, having a relationship with God. And that is, is, is extremely important, more important than seeking a sign. Church, we have got to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Do not seek for a sign. The apostle said in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. I am not going to tell you to seek for a sign. I am going to tell you to seek the face of the Lord. If you seek him, you will find him. Now let's look at Matthew. Chapter 23. From verse 1 through to verse 7. Then spake Jesus unto the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, and all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, and do not, and do, but do ye not after their works. So Jesus Christ said, look here, they sit in Moses' seat, and whatever they tell you to do, do it. But don't do after they do. It simply means that these scribes and Pharisees were telling the people, giving the people a yoke, a burden to, to carry, that they themselves will not carry. And as individuals, we know that God has given us good leaders. Because they set the example. The apostle said, follow me as I follow Christ. So when you're looking on on your leaders, you will know. Anything that your leaders preach, anything that your leaders teach, they should be living it. They should be doing it. And, and by all means of what I'm seeing, I believe that the leaders... Whatever we preach, whatever we teach, we are trying our very best to live and to do the same. So we are not going to give you a yoke as individuals to say, you carry this yoke, but I am not going to do it. And that is a sign of good leadership. The leader will not tell the subordinate to do anything that he himself is not willing to do. If you are going to lead by example, then that is what must be done. And when you look on the on the leaders of your local assembly, you are going to see that your leaders are doing the same thing that they are preaching. So let us jump down again now to St. Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men who are living to be seen of men. So Jesus was now saying to the, to the people that the Pharisees and the scribes, whatever they do, they do to be seen of men. We are in an era, a time of social media where everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants somebody to post up kind of some pictures and, and, and people like. You have some folks, if they're going to the bathroom, they carry their phones with them and they send out something, I am going to the bathroom. And if they're doing something, they take a picture, I am going to bed, I am going to comb my hair, I'm going to do something because people in this time want to be seen. When we look at what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 1 through to verse 5, The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. 
For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covicious, boasters, proud, blasphemer, disobedient to parents, and thankful and holy, without natural affection, truth bearers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, I minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, the Bible says, turn away. And we are in a time right now of social media and what is happening in a lot of our young people. Amen. And, and, and some not so young are being hooked into the social media. Not that it is, it, is, it is not good, not that you can't get things done with it. But we have to be so careful that we don't get so hooked up and tied up. So men now are becoming focused on themselves. And every, everything that they do, look here, is a picture. And every time you go on somebody's WhatsApp status, amen, there's a different photo. And, and you wonder how some folks have time to change photo every day. But look here, as people of God, we have got to be wise in this time and understand that the adversary is putting everything before us to take up our time so that we don't give God any. But it's time that we put it in reverse. Give God the time. And spend less time on the social. I'm talking to the young people tonight. I'm talking to those now who are hooked. Men have become lovers of themselves. And it's the same thing we said with Ananias and Sapphira. They wanted to be seen. It's their property. They sold the property. But they wanted to be seen. And what they do? Sold the property. They came to the apostles and said, we, we sell it for $40. When indeed they sold it for 60 And they, just because they wanted, to, they wanted a good pat on their back, they wanted the apostles to say, well, brother Ananias and Sister Sapphira, they sold the property and they gave everything to the church. Just because they wanted to be seen. And the Bible is saying that we are living in a time where men, all they want to do is to be seen. And the time is now. As individuals, we must remain humble. Let us turn to Proverbs 16. From 16 through to 18. As individuals, we have got to be humble. Irrespective of how God bless you. We must remain humble. Sometimes we get all the blessing and we, we just don't even have to tell anybody. Yes, you want to testify about the goodness of God. But we have to just remain humble. What God, it, is, it is God that is the common factor among all safe persons. And if he chooses to bless one individual a particular way, the next individual is being blessed a different way. So there is no need for us to... to Become boasters and showing up ourselves. There's no need for that. Proverbs 16. How much better it is to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. Not sure I have that scripture right. Proverbs chapter 16. It says, These six things do it the Lord hate. Proverbs chapter 6. These six things do it the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And here. The Lord, the Bible says, the Lord hate a proud look. I am not telling us, you know, because I like to, to put on nice clothes and I like to look nice when I go out. And then you now, my wife, when, when I put on certain, she said, no, ever you can't go out on the road, you're going to represent me. You know, as men, sometimes we will just go out there. But when we re remember now that we're representing the wife, we have to, 
and she take out the clothes and yes she want her husband i want to look good too but i don't have to boast on anybody if 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 god give me new things him give me new things because there was a time when we had it's just one suit one shirt one pants coming to church so if god bring me from there and I can boast in God, but I'm not boasting on my brother or my sister to say, look what I have on on you. No, that is not what. And the Pharisees, they wanted to be seen. They wanted when they are walking somewhere, see a Pharisee is there, so they have on the long gown. Because they wanted to be seen. And as individuals, we need to be humble. Nobody has to see us. And I told us even last week that I went to, to visit some church and they said, come, come. And I said, no, I am all right, right. And nobody has to see me. Amen. And so I want to encourage us as individuals that we, we, we need to be humble. Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They wanted to be seen. And some folks in church, they are doing things for people to see them. But we wear of the spirit. Amen. Galatians 3, 27 and 28. For ye are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. E are all one. It, so look here, we don't have to be showing off and boasting on anybody. Because God is the common factor. And because God is the common factor, we are all one at the foot of the cross. All of us live right. All of us get into the same place. All of us live right. You are not going to get there before me. We are all going to get there. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we that are alive shall be caught up. And together we shall meet him. So there is no need for any boasting. It doesn't matter how educated you are. It don't matter how good you can speak. It don't matter. The... We are all one at the foot of the cross. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. No, no show off thing, no boasting thing. Amen. But be humble and serve God. Yes, put on your clothes and look good. But be humble and serve the Lord. Now let us go down to... St. Matthew, still St. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 14. You can also find the reference for this in St. Mark, in Mark chapter 12, verse 38 through to 40. St. Matthew chapter 23. So here is what the Pharisees, Jesus said the Pharisees did. They devour widows' houses. Hallelujah. They devour widows' houses. Let us look at the scripture. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for he devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, make long pride. We're not even, let us look at the first part of the scripture. For he devour widows' houses. What did Jesus mean by this? When we look in the Old Testament and we see the different encounters the prophets had with widows, we recognize that the widows hardly have anything in their homes. When we look at the widow at Zarephath, 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to look at that one. When we look at the widow at Zarephath, she had nothing in her house. But Jesus is saying a practice of the Pharisees 
is to devour the widow's houses. So let us look at 1 Kings chapter 17. Beginning from verse 10. So he arose, this was saying the prophet now, arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? And she was going to get, and as she was going to get it, he called and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord liveth, your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Listen, this is the widow speaking now, you know. I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home. And make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. So the widow was saying that she had nothing in her house. Let us find out so 2 Kings 4 from 1 verse 1 and verse 2. The widow was also saying that she had nothing in her house except for a little oil and a little flour that she going to bake something. And after she eat it, the hope was gone because there was nothing else. The widow. And Jesus said that the Pharisees, they devour widows' houses. Now the wife of a man from the company of the prophet carried, cried unto Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slave. Elijah replied unto her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all. She said. So this again is the widow, you know. She said, look here, your, your servant has nothing there at all. Except a little aisle. She have the aisle, but she don't have nothing to cook. Can't even fry a planting. So all she had, she said, was nothing except for a little oil. So the first scripture we read, the widow said she had nothing except for flour and a little oil. The second said that she had nothing except for a little oil. So the houses of widows, when the bread widow has passed off, it, is, it was hard for the widow to survive. Because in those days, the ladies did not go out to work. So when the bread widow passed off, it was hard for them to survive. And we see it with two widows here. That they had nothing in their houses. So for Jesus to say that they robbed widows' houses. It meant that they took from the widow. The nothing that she had. It was next to extortion. And Jesus hit out against it. Tonight I want us to understand that this very same spirit, the spirit of the Pharisees is operating in today's world. These false teachers 
who care not whether you are scrapping from the bottom of the barrel, scrapping from the last in your bank account. They don't care if this is your last of your saving. They will tell you to sow a seed. Sow a seed and you will receive a blessing of the Lord. I remember as we started out this subject, I remember telling you about my neighbor, my neighbor. He's not working. Do a little bit of carving now and then. And this man had a refrigerator. And he had a stove. And he went to one of these places where they convinced him. The same spirit that robbed widows' houses. The same spirit convinced him to sell the refrigerator. Sell the stove. And take the money to them. Sow a seed and you will receive a blessing. I don't know if he expected that selling the, free, the refrigerator, selling the stove would have given him a new one. But the last time I passed him, he was still cooking on the wood stove. And you understand what Jesus was now, when he said they rob widows' houses. These so-called prophets, these so-called teachers, they will talk you until you get to the point where you say, yes, I am going to do it. When you look, they have jets. When you look, they have limousines. When you look, they have the, the, the newest vehicles. And they will take, for you, take from you take from you and they will fatten themselves. They are not interested in your soul. The only interest they have is to line their pockets. And the Bible says that the Pharisees, Jesus said that the Pharisees, they devour widows' houses. I want the church to understand tonight that we are still dealing with that spirit today in that we are have some, some, some new age Pharisees that they are very good in convincing folks to sow. Very good in convincing folks to take out their life savings and put it in what we think is a work of God. And folks have given their life savings. Folks have broke their saving pan just to sow a seed to get a blessing. And up until today, the blessing can't come. But the adversary knows, hallelujah, the adversary knows what folks are looking for. And he's giving folks what they are looking for. Folks are looking for a sign. Folks want to, 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 to just receive. And the adversary plays upon this. And the agents of the adversary plays upon this. And they are gold diggers. Money is more important to them than the souls of men. And they will deceive people. They are deceiving people. Even born again believers. Have believed in this sowing a seed. And I want the church to understand tonight. That we need to be aware of the living of the Pharisees. It's a serious thing. Serious thing. It will take your life saving. Take everything that you have. Take everything that you have. And you see the bishop having six, seven houses. I've seen it. I've seen 
I've seen individuals start church, start a church. And in no time that individual is able to purchase a house. And then by two years time I heard that the individual purchased another house. And that individual is doing full time ministry. I have a piece of property. And I'll know I can't come up with the money to start the house. But these persons are so skilled. I'm telling you, they are so skilled that they are able to persuade people to give them their life savings. Under the disguise of saying that you are contributing to the church. And I want to one individuals tonight, I want to tell those who are born again that you need to identify these things and know when you're giving to the work of God from when you're giving to these men that are craving for gold and silver. So they devour widows' houses. Beware of the laven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Let us go down now to St. Matthew chapter 23 still, and let's look now at verse 27. So, and we will close off now the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. But let us look at the scripture. Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and, all, and of all uncleanness. Even so, even ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy, and iniquity. So the scribes, the, the Pharisees look righteous because when they come in, they're in the long room and, and look decent and you see them and you say, see a Pharisee come in. And they look like they're serving God. So Jesus said, they are whited so polkas, so in Christmas here in Jamaica, one of the things that is done is that they use whitewash and they, they whitewash the sidewalks. It's a similar case when Jesus says whited sepulchre is like whitewash. You ever pass the cemetery yet and they, and they use whitewash in first time days, use whitewash and they, so it's the same thing. And whitewash. So Jesus said that these Pharisees are whited sepulchre. They have nothing on the inside. Inside is full of hypocrisy and dead men bones. So they might look like a child of God. They might talk like a child of God. But inside they are filled of dead men bones. And you will know because it, they might hide it for a while in about after a time it won't come out. So today, folks are like what Jesus Christ described. They come to church under the hat, come to church well put together. But at the same time, they have nothing on the inside. They are whited sepulchers. Inside, they are not clean. They are full of dead man bones, full of hypocrisy and iniquity. 
I want to challenge the house of God tonight. Challenge the household of faith. If you are serving God, then serve him. Revelation chapter 22. Verses 11 and 12. If, if you are serving God, serve him. No, is not the time to be playing church. The Bible says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. My prayer tonight, my prayer tonight is that he that is unholy become holy. And he that is whited on the outside and inside is full of hypocrisy and dead men bones. Become clean on the inside. My prayer tonight for the household of faith is that we get to the point where he that is holy, let him remain holy still. Let us shun everything. Let us put aside every weight that so easily beset us. And let us run this race with patience that is set before us. If it's weight that we have to wait, let us wait upon the Lord. If we have to shun the very appearance of evil, let us shun. But he that is holy, let him remain holy still. Now is not the time to be playing church. And let us not think that if we are whited sepulchers, that we are fooling anybody. We are only fooling ourselves. And the Pharisees, they walk around and people are seeing them. They want it to be seen. They walk around and people are seeing them. They walk around. Amen. And people look upon them and say, yes, there is somebody that is serving God. But inside, they are filled with hypocrisy. And I want us to know tonight, as the church, as, as people of the living God, that we need to be aware of the laden of the Pharisees. Don't come to church. Don't, I, I always tell folks, don't come to church. Don't spend the time. Come to church and pretend. Live your life. But it's better you come to church and be serious. If you falter, yes, we understand. Or if we falter, because I'm not perfect. But look here, we have to, he that is holy, let him be holy still. Don't come to church and be whited sepulchers. On the inside is just uncleanness. And you, you, you come in a nice suit. Hoping to trick the crowd. You might trick the crowd. But you're not tricking God. And I want us tonight to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the leaven of the Sadducees. As individuals in this time, in this age that we are living these spirits that were there then that caused men to behave a certain way, they are here now and they are still operating. They are still telling folks that men, that there is no resurrection. They are still telling folks that, look here, walk around so that you can be seen. Do things that you can be seen. They are still robbing widows' houses. And I want us to beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now let us go down to our team scripture, which is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. And now we're looking at the doctrine of demons. Demons. 
First Timothy. No, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. We can stop there. The time will come when men will depart from the faith. This that we have come to know, repentance, water baptism, infilling of the Holy Ghost, living holy, believing in God, this that we have come to know, the Bible is saying that men will depart from the faith Depart from their relationship with God, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, and having their conscience seared with an hot iron. Forbidding to marry. Go down. Forbidding to marry. Bible is going to burst some people's bubbles tonight. Forbidding to marry. And commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. The Bible is going to burst some people's bubbles tonight. Some people are considering certain things. But listen to what the Bible says. The Bible gives a stern warning against incomplete doctrine. Against false teaching. Simply because it is more compatible with men's idea. 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 and verse 4. The apostle said to Timothy, And insists that he teaches these things. He said, if any man teach otherwise and consent not with the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doubting about question and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife. Railings, evil, sum, summarize, su summarizing. Continue. Amen. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. And destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. From such withdraw thyself. So the Bible, the, the apostle said to, to Timothy, teach that which is godly. And withdraw yourself. From these perverse things and corrupt mind and persons that will turn the truth upside it down. He said, withdraw yourself from them. We're talking about doctrine. We're looking now at the doctrine of demon, demons, you know. We mentioned it a couple of weeks ago in Galatians 1, verse 17. He said, look here. Though we are an angel preach any other gospel unto you, let him be a curse. And I say it again, though we are an angel, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be a curse. The apostle says, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. So the apostle was saying that some would be in apostate, an apostate individual is someone who departs from the faith. They know the faith they understood. And the faith 
they previously affirmed. So the person who is in an apostate state is somebody that was saved like we know it and has left that and has gone to something else because they have given heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. So an apostate is not someone who never knew, but someone who knew. Not someone who never believed, but someone who believed. But because they never really knew God, because they never really hungered and thirst for God, they were lured by the voices of these seducing spirits and lured by the voice of these demons. They were led, as it were, astray by seducing spirit. And that's what the Bible says in verse 1. Let me remind us that all false religion and all false doctrine and idol worship is pushed, propagated by demonic influence. They are energized by seducing spirit and doctrines and demonic spirits. False religion, false doctrine are the playground of demons. Let us look at 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. And here the passage made it clear. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, hallelujah, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. I want us to understand that even in the church, there come among us and sit among us those who have transformed themselves into the angel of light. Let us not think that it is somebody over there that has a building and has something like a church and he is the head of the church, that that is the only instance it can happen. And the Bible continues and says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed. As the ministers of righteousness. The Bible says the ministers of Satan transform as the ministers of righteousness. Whose hand shall be according to their works. Satan and his angel disguise themselves as angels of light. And become purveyors of false doctrine and false religion. They call men to worship here and there. Their systems. Or their styles all leads to worshiping Satan himself. Behind the system, behind the idol, is a demon set up to gain worship for Satan himself. The Bible in Leviticus 17, verse 7 says, Whatever man sacrificed to idols, they sacrifice unto demons. And Deuteronomy 32, verse 17, whatever man sacrificed to idols, again they sacrifice to demons. So they sacrifice unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Behind all other gods, come on, G-O-D, are demons. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, Those of you who come to the table of the Lord and then go back to sin cannot serve the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So he was saying that you can't serve, and we know it, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve at the table of the Lord and then serve the table of demons.
So don't imagine that an idol, and your car can be a idol, your house can be a idol. Don't imagine that your, your business can be a idol. Don't imagine that an idol is something that is just dear. We cannot simply think that behind a false doctrine is just misinterpretation of scriptures. And men now just teach what they think they understand. Let us not think that. Let us not think that behind a false religion is just misinterpretation. No. Behind the false religion, behind the false doctrine, behind the idols are demons. And the apostle said that men will depart from the faith in the last days and give themselves to seducing spirit and doctrine of devils. Behind the influence of all these are fallen angel and satanic system of spirit who through that means are seducing people away from the truth into eternal damnation how are the doctrines of demon promulgated they are delivered through human instructors so just like how i am teaching here just like how bishop just like how another minister would come and teach these Spirits are false doctrine, false teaching are promulgated by men who are influenced by demons. Let us not think that you will see a demon coming before you and preach. No. Hallelujah. They, they have hosts. They have men that are willing. They have men that for riches would give themselves over to demons just to get the riches. And these are men. Under the influence of demons who are teaching things, have something like a church, you know. So let us not mistake it. Have something like a church, but inside there, and we're not talking about the known satanic buildings. No, we're talking places like church. Set up somebody coming shirt and tie, but when they preach, oh God, you, you recognize that it's far from the truth. And sometimes you don't even have to go anywhere. You just turn on the television. And you see what is happening. They preach but they don't live what they preach. Coming again from the Pharisees. They are hypocrites. These false teachers... Maybe personal, personable. They have pleasant appearance and good manner, charming and persuasive, but they do not receive their messages from the Holy Spirit. Rather, they take their spout, the suggestions of evil spirit, whose work is to lead the people astray. We spoke about how to identify false doctrine and false teaching in our earlier weeks. And we put up our chart and we talk about what the, what the true doctrine will do. And we put up what the, so we understand, amen, what is happening. But when we look at the doctrine of demons, these men are, are directly influenced by demons. And they will come and they will speak and they will woe you and they will persuade you to even join their movement. How many, how many movements have we heard of people being locked away and men follow? It is not just like that. It is influenced by Satan himself. So what exactly should we look for? The Bible just gives us a few things. But we will know anything that goes against the word of God. But hear what Paul said to Timothy. 
in 1 Timothy 4. Go back from verse 2. The speaking lies, having their conscience seared with an hot iron. Three. They forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So once it's meat, we can pray over it and we can eat it. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be what? Rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Because it is consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. So whatever I said before you, you see, once you pray over that, mighty God, it can be have any movement in this day and age that is telling people to abstain from meat is coming straight out of hell. And that is why I said earlier on that the Bible is going to burst some people's bubble. Anywhere you know that is teaching to abstain from any kind of meat, it is doctrine of demon. It is not my words. It is what the Bible just said, which is what we just read. For they will tell you to abstain from meat when God said meat you can't eat. They will tell you that don't get married. Because if you don't get married, you're going to keep yourself pure. But Jesus, marriage is an institution of God. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. And any movement that is telling folks that don't get married, keep yourself pure. Hallelujah. Is preaching, teaching from demonic influences, doctrine of devils. The Bible says it. According to the scripture that we read, we should not follow any person, any movement, any group that forbid marriage or that place restriction on certain foods. No, as individuals. You know, I am getting a little bit up there, so I'm going to cut down upon the pork. I will know pork nice. Amen. Pork nice. I want to jerk and look here. But, but, hallelujah. But hear me now. I cut down half it, you know. But I am not going to tell anybody, say, don't eat the pork. What the Bible say, if you, if you, if you, the, the prayer of thanksgiving and it is ready to be eaten. Even as we look in the religious arena today, there are some folks, remember me say it's anything that goes against what God has ordained. So God has ordained that for this car shall a man leave mother and father and cleave to his wife, not cleave to another man or a woman cleave to another woman. Hallelujah. I'm going as Holy Ghost bid me now. When I leave my house, my wife says, follow the, I follow in the Holy Ghost. Look here. There are folks who say that they have church. Tell me how you have church. And you're sanctioning gay marriages. You don't see that that is coming straight from Satan himself. And you say you have church. How is it? And look here now. The Bible says what we just read now about the doctrine of the Sadducees and Pharisees. Jesus said they are hypocrites. You know who is an hypocrite? If we become friends and we know that you're doing the thing. And we know say it wrong and we don't tell you say it wrong. I would be an hypocrite. There are folks in church. Who covers up everything. 
Once they get in the, the offering, once they have the numbers, they're good. And they will not mention in a service. And even if they do mention, like we said earlier on in the lesson, it, they come with, with, with ten apologies first before they talk what the Bible says. When it comes to the Bible and what the Bible says, sometimes it really don't have any sense. And yes, while we, we try to be like bishop and, 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 and curve the thing and try to present it so that we don't, we don't, we don't. But look here, when the word of God comes, you, you must feel shame. Because the word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. So when we give you the word, look here, I reprove you, I reprove you. When you're being reproved, you must feel away. So you can go home now and go find a corner and repent. But we're not going to sugarcoat it and cover it up in the name of Jesus. Cover it up and we come now and we, we know that it is dear. And we, we, we don't eat the individual. But we eat the hack, the hack of sin. And we know that when we see places that they say that is church and the church, amen. So-called so -called church are saying that same-sex marriages is acceptable. That is straight from Satan himself. And we come against it in the name of Jesus Christ. As people of God, we got to wake up. And look at what is happening around us. So it doesn't matter how the establishment look. It doesn't matter how organized they be. Once they embrace these kind of things. You know that it's coming straight from hell. And these kinds of teaching. Are straight from demons. And the Bible says so. In the Garden of Eden. Amen. In the Garden of Eden. Eve encountered the doctrine of demon. Satan himself, you know, this is what the, the doctrine of demon does. Satan himself came and preached to her. And he said, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The first thing he tried to do is get, have her to question if God really said that. At the beginning of the conversation, Satan questioned. So the doctrine of demons, what they do, will always question the teachings of God. And then they will substitute their own teaching instead of God's. And once you start go there and get hooked to that. You find out that after a time. You stop giving heed to the true things of God. And completely sold out to the adversary. Satan is the father of lies. A murderer from the beginning. And the doctrines taught by demons, true agents of willing human, accomplishes many things. And they separate people from God. And the blessing that God has in store for them. I want to tell somebody tonight that God have a blessing in store for you. If you tarry. Amen. If you walk the path, God have a blessing in store for you. But if you turn from the truth and begin to follow Satan, you will hear on that day, depart from me, I know you not. Let us not fool ourselves. Satan knows how to manipulate. He knows how to persuade. And that is why the doctrine of demons are so effective. If he got one third of those who, who, who were in the presence of God to fall. How much more you and I? The Bible in Psalms said that we were made a little bit lower than the angels. And he got those who were angels 
to turn from God. In this time that we are living, it is only the Holy Spirit, it is only faith in God that is going to keep us. And we must endeavor to have a relationship with God. Amen, amen. Let us now go down so, so the doctrine of demon, we deal with the doctrine of demon. Amen, and we understand that let us in the meantime find Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 through to 17. So we look at now the doctrine of demons and we said that they go against God. We say anything that say you must eat meat or a certain kind of meat, anything that say you don't marry, you must be married, it is a doctrine from hell itself. And the Bible says that. So let us look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. 12 to 17, sorry. And, the end, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things said he which had the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So what you are saying now about the church at Pergamos, you know, is that where the church is, Satan's seat is there. Which means that evil to the highest degree happens there. So I'm saying, I know that works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. So even where Satan's seat is, the church was holding fast the name of Jesus Christ. And has not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast dared them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which thing I hate. Repent. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my, my mouth. He that had done here, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. So the Bible said he had a few things against the church. The church was, of Pergamos was where Satan's seat was, or is. It says Satan's seat is there. Pure wickedness happened there. Mention that there was a man that was a martyr, they killed him. But he said, no, I have, and you did, you did good to be in the midst where Satan's seat was and still hold firm to my name. But he said, I still have a few things against you. One, because you hold the doctrine of Balaam. And two, because you had also them there that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. Let me first point out that the word of God came to the church of Pergamos and he was saying to the church that you have them there in the church, not a part of the church, but in the building, gather with the folks, them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. The Bible says that Balaam taught Balak to sin, taught Balak to cast tumbling block, sorry, before the children of Israel. And there are folks in the church 
who the adversary used today to cast tumbling box before the people of God. Remember, we talk about the doctrine of demons. We say these persons will transform themselves into the angel of light. So you see them and you think are light. But if you go to them to advice, for advice, they're going to tell you, sample it before you get married. And them in the church, in the church, they gather with us. But they're not a part of the church. And you look up to them. But when you go to them for certain advice, boy, you know, him like me. Well, if him like you, you know, you can't marry them, the pussy in a bag. In the church. Let us look at Numbers chapter 22. Let us go from Numbers 22. And we'll be doing a little bit of reading here. Amen. From verse 3 to, through to 7. And Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are around about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, behold, they cover the face of the earth and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore. The children of Israel don't do this man anything. But him just see them and say, them Abide against me. So come now, there. For I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Pray adventure, I shall prevail that we may smite them. Hallelujah. And that I might drive them out of the land. For I would that he whom thou blessed is blessed. And he whom thou curses is cursed. Don't move yet. So Israel was over against, against them. You know. Not sure what God had planned. But probably because of what God caused some form of thing to happen. Why this thing happened here. But look here. So it is with us as children of God. We don't do the adversary anything. So we don't do the neighbor anything. But sometimes the neighbor, because I'm hot, have a spirit attached to him. And him neighbor just don't like you. You have served God and you have walked for years. And it was all right for you to walk. But once the neighbor see you with a care, mighty God, the fire turn up. So it's the same thing. Be like saw the people. Know where they're coming from. And if he know where they're coming from, he must have heard of what took place. But yet still, I believe that his God now provoke him hard. He said, look here. Come curse me, these people. Because God was probably now ready to get rid of them. So look here. The Bible says that the men that Balak sent came with gifts to Balaam. I want you to understand that these gifts that Balaam had were gifts that he gained from From idolatry. Were gifts that he gained from witchcraft. Were gifts that he gained from the sinful things that they were involved in. And even today, ministers have sold out. 
because of the gifts of witchcraft. I want you to understand that the Illuminati is in charge of, they control the, the media. And many ministers have sold out because of the TV time. Many ministers have sold out because they want to be on air. They want to be seen, as we discussed with the Pharisee. They are in control of the media. And when you come across the media, you can't say certain things. So if you notice that most of what is preaching now is like some motivational talk. They're not mentioning about Jesus. They're not mentioning about how to be saved. They're not telling you any of that. But when you go there now, and they will tell you that, look here. And they say some things, you know, some nice things. And when they hear them, they say, man, look here, I feel good. But when you reach home, you feel tormented again. Not telling you how to be saved. And, and they have to do this because of the media time. The Bible in Titus 1, 10 and 11. For they are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Especially they of the circumcision. Whose mouth must be stopped. Who subvert the whole houses. Teaching things which they ought not to. For filthy Lucas sake. I want to tell the church tonight, you see? Pray for your leaders. Please, pray for your leaders. You see, like how we, we, we're trying to teach the truth. You can imagine if I came here, Bishop, and trust me, to, to come here now and to talk to you, and then we come and tell you some foolishness, and tell you some things that don't go so. And, and, and Bishop now have to come back and try and fix that. And we said it earlier on in the lesson that sometimes we listen to one thing. And it mix up our mind and we have to come to Bishop and come to the elder. And the elder try to, 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 to fix it. Pray for your leaders. Because we are in a time where if we are not keep, the adversary will want us to soul out. For filthy lucre. So let us go to verse 8 now of our passage. And he said unto them, so these men now they came to the prophet Balaam. And he said unto them, lodge here this night. And I will bring you word again as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. Verse 9. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? From the question God asks, I believe that Balaam knew that these men, he should just tell these men right away, so look here, God not going to curse these people. That is just based on the question that God asked Balaam. But the gifts were there. And Balaam said unto God, Bela the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, had sent unto me, saying, Behold, these, there is a people come out of Egypt which covered the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Preadventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. You know, things say if God said this, the, the prophet would understand. But the Bible says that these men went back to Balak, and Balak sent. Even princes are, that are of higher level and sent better gifts. And when they came 
verse 15. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said unto him, Thus said Balaam the son of Zippor, Let nothing I pray thee hinder thee from coming unto me. I will promote thee unto very great honor. And I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people. Look here. If God tell me to do something, and I pray that my heart remain this way. If God tell me to do something, I tell me, say, don't do something. No care how much gold and silver before me. I still want to hold on and say, God say, I must not do it. And God came back to Balaam. And this is how God is, you know. God will not force us against our will. God came back to Balaam. And God said, Balaam, go. And these things are written for our admonition. God said to Balaam, go. What he said to him in the first place. The, you should not curse these people, for these people are blessed. And the men came back. Knowing that God changes not, BLM still entertain them and say, go back to God again. And God said, go. When BLM was on the way, there was an angel there with sword drawn. BLM could not have seen it. Because his heart was not at the place his heart was on the gifts. And this is one of the things about the doctrine of Balaam. Even before we get there, one of the things that we need to understand is that it will cause men to, to, to sell out for worldly things. Not just men, but ministers. It will cause ministers to... To sell out. And we have got to pray for our leaders. Numbers 24. Starting from verse 10. We go down to verse 23. And, and Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. So this is why... This is now Balaam going with them. Every time he opened up his mouth to curse, blessings came out. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. And he smote his hands together. Out of anger, smote his hands together and said, And Balak said unto Balaam, I call thee to curse my enemies. And behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore, now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor. But lo, the Lord that keep thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balaam, Speak not I also to thy messengers which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balaam would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. Look at verse 14. And now behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will what? Advise thee what these people shall do to thy people in the latter days. And Balaam, prof Balaam, Balaam prophesied unto Balaam and tell him that these people are going to destroy you. And the Bible says in Numbers that Balaam went his way. But here we come upon Numbers 25. Verse 1. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit war on with the daughters of Moab. And they call the people 
unto the sacrifice of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The Bible says that Israel joined himself to Baal. This tells us that if that we have the power to shun the enemy. It tells us that we are the ones who have to make the decision to allow the enemy to come in. We are the ones who have to make the decision to give the enemy an inch. And if we give him an inch, he's going to take a yard. If we resist, shun the enemy, then he will have to find somebody else. So the Bible says that Israel joined themselves and not be all joined to Israel. So when we look at the scripture, coming down to Numbers 22, 23, 24 to 25, we recognize that Balaam came to curse the people. And though he cursed them, though he came to curse the people, but when he opened his mouth, only blessing came out. And the Bible said that he left. But when we come down to Numbers chapter 25, we recognize that something happened. We see Israel joining ourselves unto Baal, and the anger of the Lord was king. They sacrificed unto, the, unto Baal, and they joined themselves unto the people. The Bible says that people began to commit war done with the daughters of Moab and they sacrificed unto their God. I am saying to us today that there is an adversary at work and what was taught to Balak is still being taught and used in the field today. Israel was a type of the church and they were befriended by Moab which caused them to sin. So the Bible in Revelation now tells us that it was Balaam who advised Balak what he should do to get the people to sin. And the people sinned against the Lord. If we join ourselves to a group, we, we know and we've been saying it. We cannot join ourselves to the world. We know that because the Bible tells us, come out from among them and be separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you. If we know it. And Balaam knew that the only thing, listen to this, the only thing that could destroy the people of God is if they are joined together with another group that is not godly. So as believers, and it's the same thing the Bible says about marriage, you know. Can't marry to somebody you see for five years, ten years, and all of a sudden this uncircumcised Philistine been telling you nice things. Buying your nice gifts. And you don't tell him, say, look here. The Bible say that me can't be joined together with somebody that is not saved. It is only when we let down our guards and join ourselves to another party, another group that is not into the truth, then we will fall. If we, however, join ourselves to a group who have a form of godliness, I just tell you a while ago, you know, about being hypocrite. If we join ourselves together with a, with a group that has a form of godliness, but is denying the power of God. We will find ourselves 
doing the same thing they are doing. And will eventually begin to deny the power of our God. So for example, as a church, you know what we believe. We go through the doctrine. If we find ourselves inviting ministers that, that preach against the eating of certain meat and find the ministers who talk, talk about a day, find ministers who talk about three gods and, and come and say, look here, you can share the pulpit. You know what is going to happen? These saints that believe in the oneness will start believing three gods. Do it. These saints who believe that every day is to be kept holy will start look up on a particular day. So hence, we can't mix. And this is what Balaam advised Balaam to do. Mix up with the people. Mingle with them. And if you do that, as I said last week and I'll say tonight, that... As men, we tend towards sin. And if we begin to mingle up in sin and mingle up in things that are not godly, before long we will find ourselves doing the things that are ungodly. We said it when we talk about the leaven of the Pharisees. A little leaven leaven at the whole lump. And so you will find that if you join yourself, if, if as a church, faith apostolic ministry, I'm local body, down by the 10 day, join ourselves to an ex organization or to somebody else who does not teach the truth, you will find that soon after we become a bunch of hypocrites, we become a bunch of devils. And Balaam advised Balaam. He advised Balak, mingle with the people and befriend them. You know, you know how it got so bad? It got so bad, you see? And that's why a little leaving, leaving at the old lump. It got so bad that they began to have intercourse in the midst of the, the congregation. No hiding, no covering. In the midst of the congregation. And look here. And this, and, this is, and this is how sin is sinful, you know. And while things happen, you know. God said to Moses, kill all those who join themselves to be all. And while folks are being killed, God said, look here, take them head and put up. So that the people can see. And while that was being done, men still come in front of the congregation. Having intercourse with the daughter of Moab. And I am saying to the church tonight, and I'm going to close with this, saying to the church tonight, that if we join ourselves, hallelujah, if we join ourselves to those who do not hold the truth before long, we will be doing the same things that they are doing. Church, from such steer away. If your sister has sin and your sister is evil, you, you can't be in church and you have a best friend that is a sinner. It just can't work out. Before long, you are going to find yourself doing the same thing that the sinner is doing. God bless you tonight. Next week we come, we'll try to wrap up. We will look at the other two doctrines, the doctrine of the Nicolaitan, and then we'll look at the doctrine of Jezebel and see if we can just close off everything next week. But thank you for tuning in. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you. Just lift your hands and say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being in our midst. Thank you for your words tonight. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just close in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for everything that was said. God, we pray that your people, mighty God, oh God, will take heed unto 
what is being said. We ask God that you cover us, Lord. You see the different doctrines, amen, that is trying to, 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 to get us, God, to turn our backs on you. But we pray, God, that we will stand believing. We will stand, oh God, in this faith that you have called us to. And that you will help us, Lord Jesus, to have a made up mind. Amen. That irrespective of the winds of doctrine that will blow, that we will stand firmly in you. We give you thanks tonight for each and every soul that tune in. We pray, God, that you will bless them. Oh, God, we thank you for the medium tonight by which we can have Bible study. We thank you, God, for your love and your mercies. Bless us as we go through the rest of the week. And let us endeavor to do your perfect will. Have it your way tonight, we ask. As we give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God richly bless you. Amen. By way of announcement, um, our dear Deacon Page, you would have seen in the WhatsApp communication from the church that today was the, the viewing. And then now tomorrow at 12 p.m., which is Thursday, September the 29th, the, the 30th, we will have the funeral for our beloved deacon. And that will, you know the situation, so that will be, a link will be sent out. I think the link is sent out already. And then we can now join in via this Zoom link. Amen. And we can view and we can bid our farewell from viewing. And then, for this Sunday, we will be having two services. As you would have known last week, we had the, the government had, has increased it to 50. So we can have 50 in any given service. So what we are going to do this week, we are going to have two services, which means that we can minister to under the tent, at least 100 folk. So here is what we are going to do. First, the, the first service, which is at 9 a.m., that service is already booked out. Persons have called in, and we have taken down their names. So for the second service, we are going to ask folks to call in. Now, the first 30 folks who called in, who calls in, you are going to get the chance to come into service. Irrespective of the group that you are in, we're going to ask you to call, and we are going to take down your names. No, please remember, please remember that you are going to have to get a letter from the church if you are going to move around on that day. So which means that when you call in, you are supposed to give your WhatsApp number, or come by church on Friday, come by the office on Friday, and you will receive that letter. Now, the church number is 9050484. So call and confirm that you want to come, and the first 30 person who calls is going to get this space. Amen. So God bless you one more time. Let us pray much for the services over the weekend. In the name of the Lord.